Yes guys, so let's discuss about the accounting standard 1 which talks about disclosure of accounting policies. Now, however, when we are talking about disclosure of accounting policies, we will also have to discuss about how these accounting policies are even selected and who is vested with the responsibility of such selection here. Now, so let's take up this disclosure of accounting policies. Let's discuss first what is this accounting policy about. What is an accounting policy? Now, when we are defining an accounting policy as per AS1, it says that there are set of accounting principles and method of applying these principles in preparation and presentation of financial statements. Now what is we talking about? The set of accounting principles. Now what are these accounting principles? There are multiple accounting principles which are existing today. These generally accepted accounting principles, I am talking about a set of them. That means I am picking up a particular set. Now when I talk about depreciation, depreciation can be done as per SLM method, can be also done as per WDB, can also be done as per machine R rate, can also be done as per production units, can be done as per any other method of sum of digits as well. NUT method is there. Same way inventory valuation can be done as per FIFO method or a weighted average method. Now whenever we are talking about such kind of technology, such kind of different techniques being followed, each one is called as an accounting principle. But a company cannot adopt everything. I can't depreciate the same set of machinery as per SLM as well as a WDV. So what do we do? We are trying to pick up a particular technique. I pick up a particular method in depreciation. I pick up a particular technique in inventory evaluation. I either use a FIFO or a weighted average. I can't use both. So this is what we are trying to do, we are trying to pick up, we are trying to select, select what? Select a set of accounting principles or in a simpler generalized sense I will say, if I compare accounting principles as an entire ocean, your accounting policy is a selected bucket of water in that. So what is happening? I have a pool full of accounting principles, out of that the company is actually selecting a certain set of them and I am saying that I am adopting these in preparation of financial statements. I am going to value my inventory on a FIFO basis. I am going to depreciate my machinery on SLM basis. Now these are called a selection. A selection of a particular accounting principle which happened. So they are set of accounting principles selected and a method of applying these principles. Where am I applying these particular principles in preparation and presentation of financial statements? So this is basically the entire topic or the definition of accounting principle, accounting policies. When we are, decon we are talking about accounting policies, we said set of accounting principles. That means we are selecting a set. Now who is that who is selecting a set? This responsibility of selection. of accounting policies this is with the management a management of an enterprise selects the accounting principles to be adopted now on what basis the primary criteria for selection, my primary criteria for selection is nothing but 
to present a true and fair view of financial statements. My financial statement should present a true and fair view of the affairs of the enterprise. To present this true and fair view is the prima facie criteria by which a management selects these accounting policies. Now, if I feel that inventory being valued as per a weighted average method would present a more true and fair view than the FIFO method, then I'll have to adopt this weighted average method. Now, what could be that principle? When we are doing a FIFO method of inventory valuation, my closing stock is majority of the recent purchases that happen. Let's say there's a high inflation situation, hyper inflation situation. So what happens? The most recent price of items are much higher. So what happens? The closing stock is inflated. The closing stock is much higher in value. So instead of having this hyperinflation situation of your closing stock, I would rather go for a weighted average method so that it gets weight, weight, weight you know, average weightedly while calculating the value of closing stock. I don't have such hyperinflation taken into the closing stock value. This is basically what we're talking about selection. So management selects on what basis they will select the accounting policies in such a way that they present, the financial statements present a true and fair view of the affairs of the enterprise. So true and fair view is the primary criteria for selection of accounting policies. Other conditions for selection. Few other things to be considered for selection of accounting policies. Not conditions, guys, it is considerations. Consideration for selection of accounting policies. There are three primary considerations for selection of accounting policies. The first consideration is called as substance over form. Number two is your prudence and the third one is materiality. Substance over form. What does it mean substance over form? So you should not look at what is the form of that particular transaction. We rather look at the substance of the transaction. Now for example, we have situations which are called as Sale and repurchase agreement. What is a sale and repurchase agreement? I am going into the technicalities of that particular transaction where we deal with sale and repurchase agreement. Sale. A sold goods to B. A sold goods to B. So since the sale is happening, B will pay consideration to A. Let's say A sold goods to B for 100 rupees. However, on the same day, they enter into a cry, another agreement saying that A will repurchase those goods from B after 6 months at 105 rupees. Now can you tell me why did A even do that? Why did A even do that? Why did he even have to sell that goods? Why did he want to again purchase the good after 6 months at 105 rupees? Now understand the logic is very simple. At the end of both the transaction who holds the goods? Again A only got the goods. But the essence of the transaction is not a sale. There is no repurchase. Actually think about the essence. On the day 1, on the day 1, when A sells goods to B, B gave him 100 rupees. But after 6 months, when A will repurchase the goods, then A will have to pay B 105 rupees. So what kind of a transaction is this? A purchased it, sorry, A got 100 rupees on sale. A is paying 105 rupees on repurchase. He is paying 5 rupees extra. Why did he pay this 5 rupees extra? Because he was using these funds for 6 months period. Since he used that 100 rupees for 6 months period, he is actually paying that 5 rupees extra to B. So that 5 rupees will not be considered as profit. That 5 rupees will not be considered as a loss. It will rather be considered as interest is what he says. Substance. What is the substance of the transaction? If you look at the form of the transaction, I will say there are two transactions. A sold the goods, then A purchased the goods. Sale and purchase. Absolutely wrong. Though you are talking about a sale and a repurchase on a combination basis, when both are looked at a combination basis, the essence of the transaction, 
or rather we call it as substance of the transaction is basically of financial nature. The difference between the sale price and repurchase price, always repurchase price is higher than the sale price, the difference is called as interest. Right? So this is called as substance over form. To take a simpler example to explain substance over form, let's say you go for a delivery of a car. Now what does a what does the buyer manager come up to you and say, Sir, this is your car. What did he hand over? Did he hand over the car to you? He handed over only the key to you. Now understand guys, when we are talking about that key is giving an access to that car. So if he is handing over the key, in substance he even handed over the car. But in form, what do you see that as? I see only it as a form of a key. It is not the car itself. So this is basically the difference between a substance or a form. So always, whenever you are talking about accounting, especially we don't account for the key. I account for the entire car purchased. So this is basically we are talking about a sense of what is the substance over form. What is the prudence? Prudence can also be called as conservatism. Very popularly known as conservatism concept. Your conservatism concept says all the foreseeable losses should be provided for. Let's say for suppose I have raw material in my goods. I have a raw material stock which is already left out with me. And the finished good for which it can be used. That raw material can be used to produce a certain finished good. And I am saying my estimated selling price of that finished good has actually fell down. Drastically, dramatically the values of price are very low. Now it has come down to such low level that the cost of production is more than the selling price. Did I produce? No, I did not produce. I can still see that only as a raw material. But I am saying, if I produce the finished good using that raw material, I will have to sell this finished good at a cost, with, at a price which is lower than the cost. That means, if my cost of producing that finished good is 100 rupees, the current market price of that particular good is only 80. I will be incurring a loss of 20 if I manufacture. Now, we are talking about such kind of losses. They are called as estimated future losses. That means in future, if you sell, then you will incur a loss of 20 rupees. I did not incur it today. But even though you did not incur today, we will have to record for that. We will have to record even for the 20 rupees today because we say that we are talking about the 20 rupees. We basically say that that 20 rupees is an estimated future loss to be provided for as per as your prudence concept or a conservatism concept is concerned. Let's say for example, I'm taking another example. Let's say we have a rented premises. This premises was a non-cancellable lease. Non-cancellable. I can't cancel the lease for three years. After one year, I saw that, you know, basically I was not, you know, we're getting that encouragement in the profits. Our profits are much lower or rather we are talking about losses. We are turning into losses after one year. Or instead of going to a management consultant, obviously we will not go to the management consultant first. We normally go to Someone who talks about Vastu. Now this person called Vastu uh, a consultant comes in and he says basically the Vastu of this premise is not really good. It would be rather suggested for you to move out to another premise. You shifted to another premise. But the owner of the previous premise is saying, I'm sorry sir, this is a non-cancellable lease. You can't go away like that. You will have to pay this rent for me. Very good. You said no problem and I, I would prefer paying the rent than staying there. So basically, I am occupying one premises, but I am paying even the rent for the other premises which I vacated since that was a non-cancellable lease. But understand now, think from the business perspective, am I getting even one rupee of an economic benefit from that? I am not getting any economic benefit from the premises which I already vacated. But still, I am paying some expenditure as rent for that. So we say that this is an estimated future loss. For the next three years or the next two years, I will have to meet that expenditure of rent of the previous property which I have vacated, but still I am not getting any economic benefit from that. Such estimated future losses I will have to provide for and these contracts which will, which will result in a future loss are called as onerous contracts. They are called as onerous contracts. Onerous contracts is this particular word which has to be used. For estimated future losses. These contracts will result in future losses for you. Coming to the third one, materiality. 
when we talk about materiality, we will have to define materiality with respect to two things. According to your auditing, they say an item is material if it affects the decision making of a user. If it affects the decision making of a particular user, then it is a material item. That's it, as simple as that. But however, when we are defining as far as your accounts, materiality is defined in two ways. Materiality can either be a qualitative materiality or a quantitative materiality. Now what is the difference between qualitative materiality and quantitative materiality? What is the difference between both? Quantitatively material means I am talking with relation to the size of the item, the size of the transaction or the amount of the transaction. I cannot specifically say an item of transaction 1000 rupees material or not. I don't know. I can't give a reference to a materiality just by looking at the transaction because I would have to look at what is the nature of the other transactions in the organization as such. Let's talk about an enterprise which is rounding off its financial statements to 1 lakh. Anything is rounded off to lakhs. All rupees in lakhs are out. So 1000 rupee item becomes immaterial. But however, if I am talking about a very small organization, even that 1000 rupees becomes material. So basically, it is not with reference to that need, uh, amount of the transaction. But it is a reference to amount of transaction with the size of the organization. Both in combination we get something called as quantitative materiality. So to define a quantitative materiality, it is always with respect to amount of transaction and the size of the enterprise. But when we are talking about qualitative materiality, when I am defining a qualitative materiality, then I will have to define with respect to the nature of transaction and the nature of business. of enterprise comparing the nature you are comparing the amount comparing the nature in the sense sometimes few transactions might not be material while looking at the amount let's say I am a software company earning about 1000 crores of revenue 1000 crores is my turnover however I purchase a lottery or I actually bet I bet about 50,000 rupees all rupees were rounded off to the nearest crores 50,000 rupees is not a material item when you are looking at quantitative materiality. But looking at a qualitative materiality, what is the nature of transaction speculative? Is the nature of business speculative? I am here to do technology business, IT business and I am entering into a speculative transaction. It cannot be considered as an immaterial item. It is a material transaction to be reported because the user should have an information that the enterprise is entering into some information uh, into a transaction which is not basically the nature of that business. My nature of business is into software. I am supposed to do any activities which are revolving around the software business. I can't go and do a speculation business and I'll say that it is immaterial with respect to the amount of the transaction. Absolutely wrong. There you don't look at the amount of the transaction. I say still that item is material with reference to the nature of the transaction and the nature of the business of that enterprise. Clear? So this is my quantitative and qualitative materiality and this is how I select accounting policies. Now, there are particular conditions or criteria based on which the management is selected. There could be a possibility that the criteria changes. Yes, there is always a criteria that a management changes. Why can't a management opinion change? Why can't a management estimate change? Now think about a student. Initially when we start, let's score a rank man. This time I'll only concentrate on rank. One month later, let's say about he just saw the, the entire contents of the course. 
after content of the course, pass is something which we should talk about. Let's not aim at ranks. After the entire coaching is over, kaise bhi karke pass kar rahe Somehow let me pass, that is more than sufficient for me. Now crossing over, after the exams are over, he will be like, I have a hope. I have a hope that I will pass. No rank, I know, no guarantees, nothing like that. I am not confident also, I am just having a hope. So much of change in our mentality as a student, nothing from a management of a company is managing thousand crores and crores of businesses. So definitely he will have a change in a management estimate. Now when there is a change, when the, when the management thinks that there could be a change, the company has to. The management can change their accounting policies. So this is what we are talking about with respect to change in accounting policies. When we are talking with respect to change in accounting policies, the first thing that you need to understand here is reason for change. Reasons for change in accounting policy is discussed as per AS5, not contained in AS1. What are the reasons for change? First reason for change is required by statute. If it is required or the statutory requirement of changing, Or the management is of an opinion that a change in accounting policy gives better presentation to financial statements. Management is of an opinion that a change in accounting policy gives a better presentation to financial statements. Wow, whose opinion? Management's opinion. Now, whether it is correct or not, I am as an auditor, I can't say whether that is correct or not. It is that fellow's opinion. The standard has given him a right to decide whether it is correct for the enterprise or not. Me as an auditor, I can't say that the management opinions is wrong. The management has a right. He has a right to give an opinion, has a right to change the accounting policy if he feels that it would give a better presentation to the financial statements. However, the management cannot say compliance to compliance to a particular accounting policy might be difficult, so I'll select the other one. If it is difficult, then you can't go for it. You need to know what gives a better presentation to the financial statements and then change your accounting policy accordingly. But whenever there is a change in accounting policy, we'll also have to think about what are the disclosure requirements when there is a change in accounting policy. Disclosure requirements for change in accounting policy. First one, disclose the fact of change. Give a fact that you have changed the accounting policy. Second one, give your reason for change. Either of the two reasons, I have seen two reasons for accounting policy changes. Either it is required by statute or it is a management opinion to present a better presentation to financial statements. These disclosure requirements are as per AS1. I am not yet done. So fact of change, reason for change. Third one is very important. Quantifiable effect of change. Quantifiable effect of change in accounting policies. Quantifiable effect of change in accounting policies on 
the current financial statements and subsequent years. A quantifiable effect of the change in accounting policies on current financial statements and for subsequent years. However, if the quantifiable effect cannot be identified, if quantifiable effect cannot be identified, I don't know what is a quantifiable effect, then disclose the fact. Quantifiable effect in the sense you should be able to give the difference. Let's say I have changed the inventory valuation from FIFO to weighted average. Then you should be exactly in a position to give the difference. What is the amount of a difference of an increase or decrease in the inventory? Because of that increase and decrease in the inventory, there will also be an effect on the profitability as well. So what is that impact on profitability it had? Now all these variations I should give on a quantifiable way. If I am not able to quantify, I am not able to give a quantifiable effect of such change, then at least state a fact that the quantifiable effect cannot be identified. This is change in accounting policy and the disclosure requirements of change. Actually sounds like we have deviated much more from the standard because basically the standard is talking about disclosure of accounting policies. Now what is this disclosure requirements? Disclosure of accounting policies. When we are talking about disclosures of accounting policies, then what to disclose, how to disclose, where to disclose. These are three very important questions to be answered. What to disclose, where to disclose, and last one, how to disclose. What do you disclose? Obviously, disclosure of accounting policies. So, accounting policies adopted in financial statements. In preparation and presentation of financial statements, whatever accounting policies you adopted have to be presented. That is called as disclosure of accounting policies. Where do I disclose? I disclose in my notes to accounts. Notes to accounts also forms part of financial statements. My financial state, my financial statements forms part of four parts. Financial statement, set of financial statements means PL, balance sheet, cash flow statement, and notes to accounts. Your notes to accounts is an explanation how the financial statements have been drafted on what accounting policies basis. All those accounting policies have to be listed under the notes to accounts. How do I disclose? Now this actually sounds funny guys but actually makes a lot of sense. He says at one place. Now what does this at one place signify? Means if there are multiple accounting policies which are being adopted, obviously you will have multiple accounting policies adopted in preparing a set of financial statements. Then all those multiple accounting policies have to be listed at one particular place only in your notes to accounts. Notes to accounts is an explanatory notes which almost runs into pages and pages. Now should it, should it be at the beginning or should it be at the end or should it be in between? I did not specify. I just said it should be at one place. That means you either disclose in between, you either disclose at the beginning, you disclose at the end, whatever it is. But make sure that all the accounting policies which are adopted in preparation of financial statements are presented at one particular place. Your financial statements completely should be at one particular, your accounting policies should be all disclosed at one place in my notes to accounts. All accounting policies. Now here comes an exemption. All accounting policies adopted in preparation of financial statements are not necessary. Exceptions. Exception to this is fundamental accounting assumptions.
all accounting policies should be adopted or all accounting policies adopted in preparation of financial statements have to be disclosed however i have an exception for fundamental accounting assumption the name itself is saying fundamentally accounting assumption that means they are assume every user who is looking at a set of financial statements assume these characteristics of financial statements i don't have to specifically disclose now, what are these exemptions which are given here exceptions are for going concern consistency and accrual these three are assumed by a user of financial statements he need not you are you need not as a management again list these in my disclosure of accounting policies that means i don't specifically have to disclose saying that i have followed going concern i have adopted consistency consistently all the accounting policies have been adopted there is no change i have been accounting all my incomes and expenses on accrual basis not necessary not at all necessary these three are assumed by any user so no specific disclosure is necessary for these three these three fundamental accounting assumptions in preparation of my financial statements what is a going concern always we assume that the life of an enterprise is unlimited reason human have limited life business has infinite life business as such is an artificial person now whether it is created by law or you are not creating by law whatever it is it will continue it will continue with the business name because it is an artificial one it does not have any life to be ended so going concern i assume always it will be in perpetuity consistency all the accounting policies adopted in preparation of financial statements of the previous year have been consistently adopted even for the current year and throughout why because why did you even provide for accounting standards for consistency so that you can compare two financial statements two financial statements of my own enterprise also i can compare if i change the accounting policy last year i did as per fifo current year i valued stock as per weighted average can i compare i can't compare this is basically what is talking about so make sure that the consistency is adopted in select in in adoption sorry in presentation of financial statements in adopting them in the financial statements and preparing the financial statements the accounting policies should be consistently followed if there is a change then you have to go for additional disclosures which are necessary now accrual concept all my expenses and income should be accounted on an accrual basis that means when they fall due irrespective of whether they are paid or received i'll have to account as per accrual basis now this is the entire concept as far as your disclosure of accounting policies is concerned